Good morning. morning. Privilege to be with you this morning and to see your faces. So thankful for that. Thankful for the music and things that already we've experienced and uh, praise the Lord. I want to spend two or three minutes just thinking about the incarnation. And I'm going to ask you, first of all, then to turn to Isaiah, excuse me, Genesis 49. I've got Isaiah on the mind for some reason. Genesis 49. Now, last time we looked at Genesis 3.15, and then we looked in chapter 12 of Genesis at the Abrahamic covenant. Uh, Genesis 3.15 has to do with after the fall, when the promise of God was made that he would crush the head of Satan. And so as this progressive revelation goes along, we're beginning more and more to see what God's plan is that is unveiled. And here, when we get to 49 and verse 10, we're, we're looking here at Jacob, Israel, making proclamation as a prophet as to what will become of his 12 sons, which will, of course, become the 12 tribes of Israel. And so what he says in, in verse 10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. This Shiloh here is a word which means he who is right. Excuse me, he whose right it is. He whose right it is. The only one that has that right is Jesus Christ. This is a word for Messiah. He is the uh, one that is being prophesied here and of course, with this is the fact that Judah, the tribe of Judah, the seed of Judah, which Christ is part, which David, the forerunner, uh, as it were, uh, of Jesus Christ, will uh, is a necessity, a necessity. The, the scepter, the ruling, will not depart from Judah until Shiloh comes. Now look over in Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah, I told you I was going to get there, I had it in my head. Very important verse of Scripture, and we can only look at a, at a few of these tidbits as we're looking through, and I hate to call the Word of God tidbits, forgive me, uh, looking through the Word of God. Isaiah 9 and verse 6, following on the heels of Isaiah 7, 14, where we have that the one who will come will be born of a virgin, and now we see further information of that child in Isaiah 9, 6. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. And there will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. How's it going to happen? The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. The zeal of the Lord of hosts. Now this describes, there's only one person that's wonderful. <laughs> and that's Jesus Christ. And this is describing Christ. He is wonderful. And how wonderful it is to have these words penned and these promises made. And they're reflecting on the fact that He's coming. He's coming the first time, and this also speaks of his coming the second time as well. And we look forward to that. How wonderful is that? Now, we are engaged in a study, and I want you to turn over to the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, we are looking at the fact that Christ has already come, and yet he has been rejected by his own people who had all of these promises, and yet they had as we studied this morning in the Sunday school class, they had blindness. As those that are outside of Jesus Christ has, have blindness. The church is being formed here. That's what the book of Acts is all about. And we have before us today something that I never do, and you're gonna, we're going to have to experience this together. It's a narrative history that Stephen uses in presenting what God has been doing in history, and he does so for a purpose. 
So I'm going to try to cover 53 verses. We may be here till 7 o'clock tonight. No, I, I'm, that won't happen. Okay. We're going to try to cover all of these verses, but we're going to do so at a very high altitude. Now, this all has a purpose, and what we want to glean from it is what Stephen is saying or what his purpose is, and we will try to overview that purpose and then apply it back to ourselves because everything in the Word of God is profitable for doctrine, reproof, for instruction in righteousness that the man and woman and boy and girl of God may be thoroughly furnished unto every good work. So with that, would you bow with me, please, in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your mercies to us today. Thank you for the blessing of Jesus Christ. Thank you that we can meet around him, his precious word, Father. I pray that you'd help me to speak, that you'd give us all ears to hear, and that you'd glorify your name today. There is none like thee, and we want to do that which is pleasing in your sight. Make this study uh, rich to us, gracious Lord. Help it. Help us to understand that just as the hard heart of Israel, so is the hardness of the hearts in our world today. And we all need Christ. Glorify your name. We beseech you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Christ's ministry continues through Stephen. And Stephen is, a, is arranged be, uh, before the same council that just really a, a couple of months before crucified Christ and on similar trumped up charges from false witnesses. It, uh, Mike just read that to you back in chapter 6, verse 11 to, to 14. And as our Lord was quiet and did not answer similar false accusation, Stephen is mostly quiet about himself, about these accusations. But he responds by giving uh, an answer in a different manner. It reminds me a little bit of what God did with Job when he was being accused by Bildad, Sofar, and Elihu, and Job to some degree, about why he was treating Job the way he was. And he didn't tell Job directly what was, what was going on, but he gave him a science test. Well, here we have a history lesson. And he offers no direct personal defense, that is, Stephen doesn't, Instead, he reminds these Jews of their roots, and this alone. In other words, reality brings conviction. Now, there are what appears to be some conflicts in this whole narrative with some other places in the Word of God, and I'm not going to deal with those. Thank you. Uh, but I don't think that's necessary because if you really want to study that, and I encourage you to do so if that's a concern, you will find that, that there's always there's answers to the reason why those conflicts are there. And believe me, they are. Uh, there are reasons. There always are because the Word of God, every jot and tittle, is exactly perfect and right. Instead, we're going to look at this again to grasp its essence much to learn of God, much to learn of humanity here, and thereby to make application to us. So let's jump in. We're going to go at a high rate of speed, I hope. Look at verse 1 of chapter 7. The high priest said, Are these things so? What things? These twisted, evil, motivated, ginned up, false charges of 611 to 14. And by the way, this would be the most intimidating and frightening event for any normal person. But we've already seen Stephen's not normal. He had the face of an angel. God was with him and being seen in him. And therefore, he's okay. He's going to preach the word. Preach the word. He's going to tell it like it is. Just like the prophets of old. Just like Paul proclaimed, and just like what we're supposed to do today. Now, he had special roots. Would you go back with me quickly to Deuteronomy? Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7. 
the roots of Israel. Who is Israel and why are they so special? Notice what God says through Moses. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any of the peoples for you were fewest of all peoples but because the Lord loved you and kept the oath which he swore to your forefathers the Lord brought you out by a mighty hand and he's talking about out of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery from the hand of Pharaoh king of Egypt why did the Lord love Israel no reason is given he didn't look down the corridor of time and say, my, what a peach on the tree you are. He obviously denies that in the very context of the passage. And the point is, in this whole narrative, is that Stephen is going to preach the undeserving blessings and privileges of the offspring of Abraham. Paul would state in Romans that they had been entrusted with the oracles of God, adoption as sons, the glory, the covenants, the law, temple services, promises, and the church fathers. They had it all as far as privileges are concerned in Romans 3 and in Romans 9. They were the human source of Messiah, privileged by far more than any people on the earth. And instead of humility... They were prideful about their having Jehovah and believed themselves to be worthy somehow before God that God was impressed with them. And that's what this is all about. They were fiercely proud of their ancestry. Their pride in their heritage and offspring of twisted religion was really the basis of their salvation. And Stephen would wisely use their pride against them and show how their ancestry rejected God's messengers and in the same way rejected the Messiah. That's where I'm going. And so Stephen in this way indirectly will refute their claim of blasphemy against God and the law that they claimed that he had. And contrary to abrogating the law, of course, it is only through Christ Jesus that the law can be fulfilled. So verse 2, back to our text, Acts 7, he says, he said, and he said, hear me, brethren and fathers. That term brethren in this context is because they are all Jews, not because they're Christian. So please understand that. This is a very Jewish context. His glory here, the glory of God, the God of glory appeared, that he states, is the privilege that Israel had, which is the composite of all of the attributes of God. He is uniquely God, and therefore the, when his glory appears, that's a glory. Appeared, it wasn't Abraham seeking God, but God seeking Abraham. God chose him and his seed. And this is the origin of their privileges and implied with this. And with any time much is given, much is required, is the whole issue of the fact that they had accountability for the blessings and privileges that they have. Look at verses 3 and 4. He said to them, leave your country, he said to Abraham, and your relatives, and come and into the land that I will show you. Then he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. From there, after his father died, God had him move to this country in which you are now living. He affirms belief in God's sovereign control and care of Israel's destiny. Abraham did exactly as he was told, didn't hesitate, and followed the Lord. Verse 5 through 7. 
but he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot of ground, and yet even when he had no child, he promised that he would give it to him as a possession and to his descendants after him. But God spoke to this effect, that his descendants would be aliens in a foreign land, that they would be enslaved and mistreated for 400 years, and whatever nation to which they will be bond in bondage, I myself will judge, says God, and after that they will come out and serve me in this place. Abraham had faith under severe testing. He was told the future. We are told the future today, by the way, in this precious word. And Abraham believed God about all of that, and he moved forward by faith with these long-range promises that he was given. Verse 8, and he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac became the father of Jacob and Jacob of the 12 patriarchs. He was privileged to receive a sign, circumcision, a very odd sign. Of, and, and he was obedient to it, distinguishing his seed, his offspring, from all of the individuals on the face of of the earth, and thereby we begin to see the particular privileges that the Jewish people have in their heritage. And so far, Stephen is therefore agreeing with the pride of his accusers. But now when we get to verse 9, things are going to change. He begins the turn, the condemnation of Israel's historic rejection of God's messengers and thereby God himself and God's revealed plan. Notice verse 9. The patriarchs became jealous of Joseph and sold him into Egypt, yet God was with him. Now here we have the 12 brothers of Joseph hating him to the degree that they were going to put him to death, and you know the story behind all of that. And yet, uh, through God's providence, God protected him and accomplished his will, didn't he? The patriarchs became jealous. And by doing so, with these founding patriarchs, these 12 tribes, rejected the very one God had set apart for a special blessing, a unique blessing. Remember the dreams that Joseph had. They were guilty of opposing God and his revealed purpose. And like Cain and Abel, Cain had jealousy in his heart and they had jealousy in their heart. And by the grace of God, he got sold into Egypt. And that's where we see in verse 10 and rescued him from all his afflictions and granted him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and made him governor over Egypt and all his household. Now a famine came over all Egypt and Cana and great affliction with it, and our fathers could find no food. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our fathers there the first time. On the second visit, Joseph made himself known to his brothers and Joseph's family was disclosed to Pharaoh. Then Joseph sent word and invited Jacob, his father, and all the relatives to come to him, 75 persons in all. And Jacob went down to Egypt, and there he and his fathers died. From there they removed, were removed to Shechem and, and laid in the tomb which Abraham had purchased for a sum of money from the sons of Hamar in Shechem. Yet, he says, back in verse 10, he says, well, actually verse 9, yet God was with him, and he goes on and rescued him from his afflictions. The yet there is like the buts of Scripture, okay? It could just as well be a but. God was with him. God being God used their rejection and overruled it as described in preserving the patriarchs and their families. Now, that's going to be a pattern that is seen throughout the Word of God, including the Lord Jesus Christ in His rejection. God uses the wickedness of man and the rejection of man to complete and fulfill His purpose. So Stephen introduces the initial wrong-mindedness 
of these revered patriarchs that these foolish Jews of the day that Stephen is speaking to them were so ingrained with the greatness of them, and they had a type of greatness. I'm not going to deny that, but there was also seen in that the very depth of the wickedness and the foolishness of man and his need for Christ, his need for salvation. So using rebellion is what God does, and he fulfills his covenant promises made to Abraham concerning them. And in 17 to 43, having indirectly defended himself against false charges of blasphemy, because now he's really talking to them realistically about who Israel really is. Instead of this fanciful idea in their mind, which they also have about themselves and about the land that they possess, Stephen now moves to Israel's historic rejection of Moses. Let's look at that in verses. Well, before we do that, go over to Genesis 13 with me, please. Before we go to verses 17 to 19, Genesis 13. Because here we have the extension of the Abrahamic covenant. The extension of the Abrahamic covenant, which began in chapter 12. Look at, look at what it says in verse 14. 13, 14, the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, now lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward, for all the land which you see, I will give it to you and to your descendants forever. I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if anyone can number the dust of the earth, then your descendants can also be numbered. Arise, walk about the land through its length and breadth, for I will give it to you. This is an un conditional covenant. He requires nothing of Abraham. And it's, a, it's part of that Abrahamic covenant. Who owns the land over there today that's being fussed about? Uh, we're talking about we're going to recognize our embassy in uh, Jerusalem. Well, we should. <laughs> God Almighty gave it to them. Uh, in that sense, we're not doing them any favors, and the world is in opposition to this, just as they are in opposition to everything that God does. Amen? Amen. Okay. Now, we go back to Acts 7, look at verse 17. Acts 7, verse 17. But as the time of the promise was approaching, what is the promise? The promise of that way would be relieved from bondage in Egypt 400 years. And by the way, that looked impossible. And that's what he's going to describe here. That looks absolutely impossible. For, and and, he's, and then we're going to see that 17 down through 19, he says, But as the time of the promise was approaching, which God had assured to Abraham, the people increased and multiplied in Egypt until there arose another king over Egypt who knew nothing about Joseph. It was he who took shrewd advantage of our race and mistreated our fathers so that they would expose their infants, and that really means to kill them, and they would not survive. That little phrase, but as the time of the promise approached for what God had promised, other events intrude and seem to make the matters impossible. Time interruptions often are not shown, but here Egypt would seem to defy God's ability to do what he promised. So what did God do? Look at verse 20 to 26. It was at this time that Moses was born, and he was lovely in the sight of God, and was nurtured three months in the father's home. And after he had been set aside excuse me, set outside, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and nurtured him as her own son. Now we know that he was placed in the Nile River from other passages. Moses was educated in all the learning of the Egyptians and he was a man of power and words and deeds. Deeds. But when he was approaching the age of 40, it entered his mind to visit the brethren, the sons of Israel. And when he saw one of them being treated unjustly, he defended him and took vengeance for the oppressed by striking down the Egyptian. 
And he supposed that his brethren understood that God was granting them deliverance through him, but they did not understand. Now, they did not understand. Stephen is speaking to people that don't understand now. They are blind. They are, their ears are stopped up. It's the same thing we were looking at this morning in our study. And on the following day, he appeared to them as they were fighting together, and he tried to reconcile them in peace, saying, Men, you are brethren. Why do you injure one another? But the one who was injuring his neighbor pushed him away, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Here is these intrusion of events. God raises up Moses miraculously, had him gloriously preserved, providentially raised in the king's household, fitted, as it were, for the task of deliverance, and readied for the circumstance of deliverance as he had promised. But then you have in verse 27, but... Okay, and there's the opposition. Again, a contrast. Israel initially rejected Moses as they had initially rejected Joseph. And I hope that you're beginning to see the pattern here of, Bu of Jewish patriarchal rejection. In other words, all the prophets is what I'm really speaking of, rejected and the and, and with that, we'll also see God reacting to that, but God. And so when we get down to verse 30, we read, After 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in the flame of a burning thorn bush. When Moses saw it, he marveled at the sight. And as he approached to look more closely, there came the voice of the Lord. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Moses shook with fear and would not venture to look. But the Lord said to him, Take off the sandals from your feet, for the place in which you are standing is holy ground. I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt, and have heard their groans, and have come down to rescue them. Come now, and I will send you to Egypt. I have come down to rescue them. God still working graciously then, and still working in our day graciously, always doing exactly what he says he will do. If not, we'd all perish. Praise God he does that. Now, what is Stephen doing here? He is showing that despite the foolishness, all we like sheep have gone astray. We're like a bunch of dumb sheep. And the hardness of man's heart and the rejection of man, despite all of that, God has not forgotten His covenant promise and His promises and is moving graciously in history. He was then, and guess what? He is now. Thank you. Now, in 35 to 43, Stephen continues to expose the rebellious history of their forefathers, of which the accusers are blindly proud as if they are all without wrong. They are all without wrong. And we see this pattern in history, lack of faith, leading to rejection of God's men. So beginning in 35, look at 35 and 36. This Moses whom they disowned, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge? Is the one whom God sent to be both a ruler and a deliverer with the help of the angel and appeared to him in the thorn bush? This man led them out, performing wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. God showed himself in his glory through Moses and all of those wonderful events that took place as he miraculously delivered them out of Egypt. But initially they rejected him. And by the way, they continued to reject him in the wilderness. They continued to reject his message. They had no faith to cross into the promised land until that whole generation died, which is not spoken of here. So Stephen shows 
the highest regard for Moses, doesn't he? Whereas back in 611, if you look there, look at 611, they, here's these trumped up charges. They secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. That's not what Stephen is doing. It was not Stephen that rejected Moses. It was their patriarchs that they are, have all this confidence, this false confidence in. Look at verse 37 and 38. This is the Moses who said to the sons of Israel, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness together with the angel who was speaking to him on Mount Sinai and who was with our fathers and he received living oracles to pass on to you. Now this is a powerful statement. Who's he talking about there? He's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. He's talking about this is the one in the wilderness together with the angel speaking to him on Mount Sinai. Remember, in the burning bush, take off your sandals for where you walk is holy ground. This was the one with the glory. This was the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. How wonderful that is. And so Stephen even proclaims Christ with Moses on Sinai, and further, the living oracles is speaking of the law or God's word, and by including the oracles, Stephen affirms his belief in the law contrary to what they say in 613, that he's blaspheming the law. He's not blaspheming the law at all. So you see, in the midst of this presentation is his defense, but his defense is the word of God. So it's not Stephen who's disobeying the law, but the fathers whom the Sanhedrin revere. This is being presented by Stephen in such a manner they cannot debunk his clear presentation of the real history of Israel. Israel's history is a mess. In fact, you don't have to read much of anything if you want to look at the book of Judges if you want to see a mess where every man was doing what was right in his own eyes. And we get to 39 to 41. We read, Our fathers were unwilling to be obedient to him, but repudiated him in their hearts and turned back to Egypt. This is, of course, Moses that they're rejecting. Saying to Aaron, Make for us gods who will go before us. For this Moses who led us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what happened to him. At that time they made a calf and brought a, brought a sacrifice to the idol and were rejoicing in the works of their hands. Once again, what does Israel do? Not only reject God's leader, his law and direction, but now they even turn to foolish idols. And they spend their energy after all that God has done and all that God has revealed serving foolish idols. And Stephen is rubbing their proud noses in the reality of the sinful, foolish, terrible history of Israel's people and their sorry rejection of God and God's appointed deliverers. Look at verse 42 and 43. But God turned away and delivered them up to serve the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets. It was not to me that you offered victory victims and sacrifices 40 years in the wilderness, was it, O house of Israel? You also took along the tabernacle of Molech and the star of the god Rampha, the images which you made to worship. I also will remove you beyond Babylon, and he did. He sent them in exile, as you know, in history to Babylon and destroyed Jerusalem and destroyed the temple that would be built because of their sinful ways Romans 1, God gave them over. He allowed them to exercise their evil to the fullness. And history proves Stephen's words. Now what Stephen is proclaiming is that they are spiritually empty. Verses 44 to 47. See, we're getting there, aren't we? Amen. Our fathers had the tabernacle of testimony in the wilderness just as he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it according to the pattern which he had seen. 
And having received it in their turn, our fathers brought it with Joshua upon dispossessing the nations whom God drove out before our fathers until the time of David. David found favor in God's sight and asked that he might find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built the house for him. However, the Most High does not dwell in houses made by human hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne and earth is the footstool of my feet. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what place is there for my repose? Was it not my hand which made all these things? They were guilty of limiting God like their idols that they wanted to carry around with them to stone and wood and metals a building. And many people do the same thing today. Their buildings, their denominations, their rituals are their God, not the Lord Jesus Christ. Not living by faith, not living by what is not seen, but what is seen. They are taking their pride, their boasting in a building. And that's what they were doing in the day in which Christ spoke when he was looking over Herod's temple in Matthew 23 and, and, uh, and 24 when he said that not one stone will be left upon another because they were taking pride. Look at this wonderful structure. Aren't we religious and aren't we wonderful? They were taking their boasting in a building. Not the God seen at every turn in that building to be worshipped in spirit and in truth, their focus is wrong. They are looking and trusting wrong things. They do not know the God of the Bible. They are spiritually empty and vapid. And so beginning in verse 51, it comes the powerful summary rebuke. 51 to 53. Let's look at 51 first. You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You are doing just as your fathers did. Wow. That was a real nice political statement, wasn't it? What is their problem? I don't think this is Stephen trying to slander them. This is really a statement of fact, isn't it? He's telling the truth. They are spiritually dead. How does he word it? Stiff-necked. By the way, in the Greek, that's only used here, taken from oxen who would not submit and cannot be broken because of their incredibly strong neck. And so what he's saying is, like an oxen that cannot be broken, you are figuratively obstinate. You cannot see, you will not see what the truth and the reality is that is before your face. And so then he says in verse 51, you have an uncirc you're uncircumcised in heart. Now they understood circumcision as a sign of Moses, but they didn't really get what that was about and the promises that God had made. Again, it is a figurative thing. It was used first. Turn back there with me to Leviticus, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, chapter 26. And this is obviously what Stephen is taking it from. Verse, 20, uh, verse 41. Here is the Lord speaking. I was, through Moses, I was also acting with hostility against them to bring them into the land of their enemies, or if their uncircumcised heart becomes humble so that they then make amends for their iniquity, or if their uncircumcised heart becomes humbled. And that's what's needed there. Their uncircumcised heart. We see this again in Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Here is the, the Mosaic covenant and the follow-up on that. And if you go to verse 30, verse 6, Moreover, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart 
and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul so that you may live. What, what does this tell us? That naturally we have an uncircumcised heart, and that's figuratively speaking. In other words, God needs to do something to us. God needs to change our heart. And only He can do that. And when He does, He says, to love the Lord your God. You can't love the Lord with an uncircumcised heart. Now, there's other passages that speak of the same thing. Jeremiah 9, 36, Ezekiel 44, verse 7, speaks of the necessity of the new birth, something only God can do. So what was Israel's real problem as we unfold the curtain here is that they are in the condition of unsaved individuals. Just because God has a covenant with them to do certain things for them, uh, to reveal himself through them and to use them to give us the Savior, does not mean that they are all his born-again children. They are in the condition of the unsaved. And back in chapter 7, verse 51, he says, and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. They are in the condition of continually resisting the Holy Spirit. Not something that they have within them, but the ministry brought to them through messengers who have the Holy Spirit, refusing either to consider hearing it, resisting all influence of the Holy Spirit, all objective light, all knowledge, all evidence opposing God's message. And why does one person hear and receive that message and glory in that message and thank God for that message and other people don't? Because they have uncircumcised hearts. They have uncircumcised hearts. And a new heart is that which is required. And he connects it back to history here. And the last thing he says in verse 51, you are doing just as your fathers did. You are acting just like the Israel of the past, rejecting God's deliverers, rejecting God's purpose. How? As their fathers rejected Joseph and Moses, these rejected Jesus Christ, even the greater the more obvious, if you want to call it humanly speaking, in every sense of the word. And that's why when he goes to verse 52, he says, which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? You know, if you really study the Old Testament and the survey Randy's doing and others, you will see that every one of the preachers of the truth of God were continually rejected. They were hated. They were put down in holes in the ground. Some of them were murdered and killed because of the wickedness of man's heart not one of them was fully embraced by the people of their time they were not Mr. Popularity you know if you had a, a poll taken they would have been right on the bottom of the poll so kind of keep that in mind today with your current polls that are taken uh, the, the idea is you're acting consistent with the historical opposition of your fathers. Notice what he says. They killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one. What were they doing? They were pointing to Jesus Christ. All of them were. That's why Christ would say on the road to Emmaus when he revealed himself to those on the road, everything in the Old Testament, everything in the Word of God is about Jesus Christ. It all points to him. And he says here in his last statement, whose murderers, excuse me, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. This is the same council, the same crowd that only a few months before screamed, crucify him, crucify him, and they did. And so Stephen echoes the same words of Christ. If you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me, said the Lord Jesus in John 5, 39. We can't, don't have time to turn there. 
If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. Rejection of truth is rejection of truth. The truth has been available all the time. The truth is available today. There are no halfway Christians. We cannot believe what the world teaches and at the same time what God teaches when it's in opposition to each other. That's why Christ stated, if you're not for me, you're against me. Oh, brethren, just as Israel was privileged in its day, we are privileged in our day, aren't we? To have the truth of God before us and being taught. And he says in verse 53, he says, You who receive the law is ordained by angels and yet did not keep it. That is, you received the law. That is, you wrongly, pridefully embraced it. Not as something, as a blessing, as ordained by angels from God. You didn't keep it. You tried to keep the letter of the law, but you didn't keep the spirit of what the law was really meaning that has to do with love of God and love for others. Stephen is saying you're brazen hypocrites. And we are reminded that pride of religion will not honor God. Isaiah 66, 2 says, To this one I will look, to him who is humble and contrite of spirit and who trembles at my word. That's where we want to be. That's where we want to be. In closing... Israel's fathers had mur murdered God's prophets, and these murdered God's son, and shortly they will murder Stephen. That consistent theme throughout the history of the fallen world, a friction between the people of the world, the unsaved of the world, and even the religious of the world, and God's true people that know him and love him. There's a friction that cannot be denied and if you start trying to think that somehow you can get along with that friction and pacify it you cannot not unless you compromise the truth of God would you look back with me in closing at Luke chapter 11 the words of Jesus Christ himself Luke 11 Verses 47 to 51. He's talking here about the Pharisees and the religious leaders of his time. Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets, and it was your fathers who killed them. Sounds like Stephen, doesn't it? So you are witnesses and approve the deeds of your fathers because it was they who killed them, and you build their tombs. For this reason, all the wisdom of God said, I will send to them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will kill, and some they will persecute, so that the blood of all the prophets shed since the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the house of God. Yes, I tell you, it shall be charged against this generation. Boy, you talk about something to get concerned about. It's no wonder Paul would say he was the chief of sinners because Saul of Tarsus was right there with them, wasn't he? But God saved him. God turned him around. And so the question that I always come to is, friend, are you lined up today with Jesus Christ? Now's the time to take sides. Far, far, far better off is Stephen, who's fixing to be killed, <laughs> than these people that murdered him. I can assure you, as I said last time, where has Stephen been all these many years that have passed? And where do you think those are that murdered the prophets and murdered him? and murder the Son of God. 
Oh, my friend. God has revealed Himself. God has given us a Savior. And we have no excuse. If we haven't found our peace in Him, and trusting Him, and living for Him. And then secondly, I would say, are you ready to face the opposition? Are you ready to act like Stephen? And I would say to you, I'm probably, I'm not. I'm a coward, I'm a sissy, I'm all those things. But God, help me to have the strength to do what is pleasing to Him when my hour comes. And I pray the same thing for you. And I think He will. And in Stephen, we have a great role model, don't we? If Stephen could have dying grace, you and I can have dying grace too. And I close with Matthew 5.11. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me, says Christ. Blessed are you. Blessed are you. Nothing is better. That's hard for me to chew on than to be hated for Christ's sake. Nothing is better than that, according to him. Why? Because they hated him, didn't they? They hated him without a cause, and they'll hate you without a cause. Be lined up with Jesus Christ. I trust that everyone here has made that personal commitment to him. He is a gracious God who receives sinners and changes hearts. Praise his name. Let's bow in prayer, please. Father, again, we thank you for your holy word, and here we've sped through it, but, Father, we see the power of truth. We see the opposition it receives. We are reminded ourselves that we're in the battle. Oh, help us, our God to honor you in our life and serve you and live for you in daily situations and things that arise. Help us to serve thee truly. We praise you for your kindness in giving us a Savior. Help us to proclaim his name unashamedly. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.